Well, if this talk were pedagogic, meant to do something to you, it would ask you to start to think about all the different times you were invested in. Long-term time, short-term time, fearful time, seasonal time, getting old time, or <laughs> staying young time. Uh, we are really in different times, and that would be the principal thing I'd like you to get out of the talk. The second thing I'd like you to get out of it is uh, the drop something. Can you all hear me without? My voice gets louder and louder. I used to be able to tell my grandparents' village in Sicily because that's where they shouted larger, louder than the average person shouted. We all talk pretty, pretty big. Uh, the second thing, I hope that I can make sense of the word poetics of time to you, but I'm not sure I can. There's a book by that title, or a set of essays that I found after I wrote mine. But I like the notion that poetics kind of change, that it churn and metamorphose and mutate and form things into images and ideas. But I don't expect you to decide how much of poetry is juxtaposition, how much is metaphor, how much is sound. But I, I like the idea of the poetics of time probably came from Aristotle, who had a book on poetics. So that's, that's the first thing I do in the talk. Second thing I'd have you realize, or try to think about, is how much are your views of time, how much have they been medicalized? You begin to think of where you are now in time in terms of how one of your systems is working or not working. Or you begin to think of yourself in terms of the diagnoses you got just lately, or your own prognosis based on your latest diabetes count. And a lot of um, our thinking about time has been moved over, it's been medicalized. And nothing wrong with that. Please, that might sound like I'm saying something awful happened. But medicine is in control of us in so many ways, and so many positive ways, that often we think of things. So that's the second thing I try to get across. The third, it's on my sheet here, if I can get it open. I would like you to realize that modern secular, meaning of this earth, and modern scientific thought has taken hold of a lot of our perspectives in terms of what will happen to us or what could happen to us or what's happening to us. And that view is very powerful. However, most of us remain like a typical hospital, and particularly a religious hospital. The doctor comes and goes, and meantime we say a rosary between visits. The doctor comes and goes, and we're thinking about the baptism of a grandchild. It's so frequently in us, there are older, and religion isn't the older one, there's superstitions, there's fears. There's just a lot of experiences in us that we've picked up. Some are right in the English language about the future. So that's sort of what I do, and I'm going to try to do. And uh, first of all, the word diagnosis probably didn't come into use in Greek, it means to know through or know across, the way a diameter runs across. And gnosis in Greek always implies knowledge. You hear it in the word gnostic. So a diagnosis kind of means to know something through or from top to bottom or across. 
or you could just say it's to know a subject, to penetrate a subject, but it doesn't come into use until the 1850s. Like a lot of Greek terms, that's a Greek term, it's, it comes with modern science. As soon as people want to dress up what they're doing, make it seem important, they started to give it labels. Sometimes the labels were Latin, but more often the roots of them are Greek, and part of the thing is that Latin derives some of its own kind of official talk on Greek, and kind of developed its own thought on Greek. So often diagnostics was used that way. Now I walk by the car dealer where you get your tires changed, and one of the booths you could drive your car in was called Diagnostic. <laughs> and then, usually diagnosis, if we like it or not, comes with prognosis. Where are we, and where are we going to end up? So we have the diagnosis, and that comes with prognosis, and that word it didn't get used to the 1890s, really. And then, of course, it spreads into everything. We could have a prognosis of your God knows why. But it started as a medical thing, meaning what's the course of your disease? It could mean what's your life expectancy now you got the disease. And uh, But diagnosis did more. It also dealt with therapies. It dealt with all sorts of things. It was a very vast word. Now, just to be personal for one second here, I was one of the kids, maybe some of you were, who frequently went to bed when I was five or seven years old, mulling on, will I get up tomorrow? Mulling on, what would it be like if I weren't? Now, that doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense. What would I be like if I wasn't here? But that thought caught my fancy. Uh, it was probably helped by an extended Catholic education, although thank goodness I didn't go to Catholic school. I only went to parole. I only went to catechism, so it spared me some of the intensity I might have gotten. Uh, because contemplating on skulls on your desk is one of our monastic specialties. We're not the only ones who do that, or the only religion, but. We're pretty elaborate on that. Now, just to tease, I ran across a saint, a French Canadian saint I just love. It was Saint, saint Expedit. And to translate that into English, Saint Expeditions. And anything you needed done, he'd do. It was a real do all saint. I, I need one of those, but then I went into history, um, maybe because I had it, it was the only thing I could do, and that makes us sort of a mortician of the past, or the undertaker of the past, or something, I mean, rescuing the past went with our profession, or arguing about the past, or keeping tabs, so we were the grave, grave keepers. Of, of the professions, although then the archaeologists got a bigger dig on us and they became the long-term grave keepers. They went back when they weren't even sure if they had a human on their hands or not. They wanted to reconstruct and memorize and me make memories of them right up. So I had a long, long tradition of thinking about that. And when I wrote my book on bypass, which was, I went into one of these doctors at the clinic here at Marshall. I was 50 years old. I'm considerably older than 50 now. I thought 50 was a tragedy. <laughs> Since then, it gets giddier and giddier each year. But I didn't like 50. But when I was 50, I went into the doctor and he said, oh yeah, you have adult onset diabetes. And we think you have some coronary blockage in a couple arteries. <laughs> I mean, you walked in there a racquetball player. He's playing 
Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you feel like you've gotten into a little bigger game of life than you want. All of a sudden, time takes a bite out of you. And so that was a pretty big bite. And I thought, hey, we got a bypass because it was, this was back a while ago. When somebody said, I'm going for a bypass, I felt like it was time to say farewell to them. I, I didn't know you survived them. I thought they just got to land where we sure am. But yeah, uh, so that caught my fancy of mortality. And I equated it. I like the image when I wrote the bypass book. I like the image of skating across black ice. That's what life is, is skating across black ice. And, and black ice uh, carries wealth. If you ever skated like in the open when the ice cracks and, it's, and then it's black, that usually implies the water below is infinitely deep. You're like ice skating on the ocean. So all of that was in my head and then uh, my wife was here she had a cancer diagnosis, and we've dealt with that the last two years in Mayo. So that certainly has put her and, to a degree, me in diagnoses, really. If you want to think of the word diagnosis, don't think there is a diagnosis. There's diagnoses. They tell you something. They give you a treatment, and then what do they do? They diagnose the treatments. <coughs> and they treat you for a while, and you get another diagnosis. So I mean, it's, it's you toggle back and forth. And fortunately, my wife's had good treatment. I had good treatment. In fact, we've had very fine professionals wherever we were. But also, there is the problem of many people can't find a diagnosis for what's wrong with them. They got a hundred symptoms, but they can't corral. Worse yet, maybe, is if they get a, they choose a couple of the symptoms and they corral it and they get the wrong, the wrong diagnosis. That's a very big problem. And it is because we diagnose so much. A hundred years ago, they couldn't diagnose some of the things they do today because they didn't even know how they worked. But over the last 300 years, we've become somewhat a system or a machine, so they know us better. They know us better and better. And even when they don't know us well, there's all kinds of institutions, foundations, find out what's going on with us. And one last note, even governments promise us they're going to give us good health care, and we believe it, and we expect it, and we get angry when we don't get good care. I mean, so I'm not saying anything new, but diagnosis and medical diagnosis is big. Now let's see some, let's hear some poems that are considerably different than that kind of talk. And I get my glasses on, if I can find them now. And I'm going to read you poems that are just meant to evoke things about diagnosis and put you in time for the word that I've taken the liking is the word um, I forgot what I was saying there. Here's the first poem. There's many different kinds of poems here, but here's one called Time Dances a Silly. Awake, alive by glance, we arrive at the dance. Our partner, club and wing-footed time, does not dance to any long, predictable beat. Braiding each dance to speedy fortune, and slow fate. I don't know why I made time a he, but I did. He steps and spins us to the instant, the trudge of the seasons, the twisting circles of beginnings and ends. 
of subtle, graceful steps and clumsy boot clops, he puts us out of time and we try to step to birth and death, love and war. So our partner time dances us silly. Our senses do not make sense. His shuddering steps twirl us inward. There, momentarily off the floor, what philosophers call a second reality of thought, mind, self, and soul, where foot rarely touches ground, we augur and pray that somehow, once or next, we dance in tune. So that's, that's one point. I was going to read you a poem by, um, about river eggs, but I want to sort of stay in time and not overburden you with too much talking. But on river eggs, since I was a boy on the Clinton River in Michigan, um, we're, we're, we're always out, we're, we're river rats. And I was always taken by how in the spring the whole river would be with spawned frog eggs. I don't know if any of you ever swum through frog eggs, where with one hand you put them out of the way, with the other you go forward. And that's always carried with me a sense of how life is so abundant, but how much of life gets wasted. So maybe I'll read the last line from that or two to get a little feeling of it. And so it's a powerful metaphor. So time, well, I'll do this. I'll, I'll start us closer. Closer to home in nearby Granite Falls, a 17-year-old boy was sentenced to life in prison. He'd instigated the robbery <coughs> of his grandmother, possibly precipitating her death in the course of the crime, else in the course of the crime elsewhere in Minnesota, a father crashed his car, then fled, leaving his injured son and daughter calling for help. One of them had a broken neck. By the way, there's just a case yesterday of a guy who left a woman dead in the car after he crashed it and he fled. So time, so history. So abundant and superfluous life, eggs on a river stream float downstream, and life encapsulated in embryo, in cars and the cockpits of fighter planes, moves joylessly, mindlessly, and cruelly. With knife, gun, and rocket, we cut a tangle of knots. We thread senseless chaos with cunning, guile, and beauty. We shape our arts, ply our crafts to float creation anew. Spring frog eggs moving downstream. So that is a, a pretty heavy duty poem. And there was another that I couldn't resist reading because this actually happened. It happened in the, big, in the back kitchen of my grandmother's where my uncle and aunt were living. He was just back. Sam, who died of cancer when he was about 35. He just got back from World War II. I played ball with him. Sam and I were, he, he was one of the many wonderful uncles I had. So I just want to read parts of the Sam poem. I talk about Uncle Sam stood in the front of a window and looked out on a small yard, a sliver of a garden in the garage, and go on describing the garage. Then I say Sam, who threw the ball hard in our games of catch. Out of the blue, Sam declared that a housefly lives only, 20, lives only a 24-hour life. And this started in the summer with people eating watermelon before the screen doors were all my goods, so they don't know how to fly, so people. My Uncle Jimmy, whose tour of infant duty went from Sicily up the boot of Italy, then over to Normandy, and finally into Germany, and tallied 14 killed enemies, disagreed with Sam. My dad did too. 
but Sam stood his ground in what proved an amicable, amicable go-around. And with the flies buzzing all around you, and one guy say, they won't last longer than 24 hours. And others say, oh, they're here to kind of stay. It was a debate. Sam died two years later after that kitchen debate. He was the first person I saw close dying. Over the life of a fly, the debate over the life of a fly. Stomach cancer took him prisoner for 18 months, reducing a 200 pound man to 100, refusing even a Christmas truce. So that was Uncle Sam. And then I'll jump ahead to a poem that says, diagnostic, such a big word. The big Greek word. Such a big word, diagnosis, such a big word for telling me whether I'm sick or well, whether I'll live out the year or die tomorrow. Time ticks, life passes, pain alerts, out of the blue, test warned. I walk precariously amid mounting symptoms and medical appointments, banging bedpans and carts of tingling glass between fear of diminishing and abruptly ending day, and hope that faith and belief prove true beyond the testing parables and books of prophecies. So, in effect, I've said, I don't know what's happening. Um, here's a poem called Give Yourself to Medicine. Any of you want to do that? Here's, here's a poem talking about giving yourself to medicine. Give yourself to medicine. Go gentle into that hopeful night. Be examined. Roll up your sleeves. This robe. Be ready for probes and scopes, for scans, bombardments by particles subatomic small. Lie flat and still in a gray metallic coffin-like cylinder. Listen to sirens of clanging magnets sail by dissecting poles, coast of blood, bone, and organ. And it goes on like that. That's the poem where we all have had experiences being diagnosed and uh, by different ways, multiple ways. And uh, here's what I take to be the poet's work. Very simple. A poet's work. Words, not some prose are the holding cordage of common days. But I would make poetry and prayer, uh, prayer the gathering of the living and the dead, the harvest of metaphor. So that's what a poet does. And I'm going to read you two last poems. I've done this a lot quicker than I could have. I hope you understand that. But uh, here's a experience I had at the new place we're living, which is senior housing. They have an odd place right in the center. It's called the atrium. And right in the center they have a big pond. Not too many people throw coins in it. Big pond. They've got palms growing up. And you feel like you're, like I did when I was 10 and I went to Miami Beach with my dad on one of his union conventions. And, uh, well, one day, into this atrium, I was drinking coffee, a hummingbird flew. And it couldn't get out. And it desperately wanted to get out. And then it was exhausted against the window. The background, just one fact. They, they like other animals, must feed themselves while they gather, in their case, uh, a honey or whatever they're gathering, a nectar. They can, in other words, run out of energy <laughs> flying from one flower to another. So, anyhow, I'm not sure I knew that before the poem, but I know myself by the compass and quickness of my eye, 
I followed the birds from Frent, frantic, frantic. How do you say that? Frenet, frenet, frantic. Well, I missed that word. It's not frantic. Frenetic. 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 That's what I want. Yeah. Frenetic flight back and forth through the clumsy metal furniture, around the fountain, in and out of the trees of our pyramid crown atrium, until exhausted when it came to rest in the bottom corner of a large window by the door. I knew myself by the touch of my fingers that took and held the hapless jewel things cupped in my hand, and I knew joy as I stepped outside, opened my palm, and opened my palms. The joy of returning the shimmering creature of flight and color to the nectar of light and flower. The rapture of giving back what is yours. That was a great experience for me to catch it and pull its wings apart and walk with it and somebody had to be there and they how it went. And it flew, it didn't go like that. So it was, it was a nice experience. And then the last poem is called Birth. And it's, you can see the poems rather progress from medicine towards religion. There's poems on in the last section, but here's a short, short poem on birth. Birth welcomes us to soil and stars, our lives a scoop of being in God's creation and son's salvation. Very classic Christian poem. So those are the poems. If there's one question or comment, I take it now, but I'll go on to something else. Mike. Uh, maybe it's in that direction where I'm going, but I imagine when you were thinking of time and various types of measurement, did you ever uh, do anything with the idea of memory in time? Well, it's, it's throughout my writings, I, even this ballast master, there's the buoyancy we keep in ourselves. And in my writings, I've been particularly concerned with the obligation to keep the dead alive in my mind. And you keep the past afloat. And in the poem of the ballast master, my uncle, uh, ship sank. He was only 17 when he joined the Navy. And his ship sank off North Africa. They thought it was a free area. <coughs> they discharged the troops. They went and were at bay. And the ship instead was torpedoed along with three others by a German submarine. He was an assistant medic and he went overboard with his friend who was dead. But he couldn't let the friend go. Now this is the amb ambiguity of his situation. He couldn't let him go because he didn't want his friend to go into the deep water. Or it's night and it's terribly alone. This is my dead friend is my companion, my life raft, my vest. And my uncle, I can't tell his whole story. It's really quite biographical. He went and lived with even though he was married and had a child, he went and lived with the widow of the fellow. And he just couldn't shake that memory. So memory, in this book, I dealt with pretty much time coming into us in all these different forms. And I'll be commenting on that later. But in, particularly in the Ballast Master, and some of in the book I wrote on the poems on Sicily, uh, Keeping the family in memory is important, and then keeping incidents in family. In one of my poems in this book, I talk about that poor guy. He and his wife are living on the front end of a building, and they hear a terrible crash. This is in Florida, which is apropos of these days. And they discover that their brother's whole bedroom has kind of gone down the sinkhole. And the only thing left is the brother's bedpost is there. And he digs frantically. And I could read you that poem later at the very end if we had time. And he walks around. And he ends up 
feeling like he's one, he's at Jericho, walking around, but he's asking God, frequently God asks, where is your brother? But in this case, he's asking God, where is my brother? Because he fell down the sinkhole. So there's a lot that goes down the sinkholes in our lives. Maybe it's a bad relationship. Maybe it's the death of someone. But you can't let, let go. So yeah, the answer is yeah, I guess. That answer? Yeah. Um, Let's do some slides, just, this won't lighten us up, but it'll be a bit smarter and look at what where they do it, they go, like, it is. Let's just do some of these, and I don't expect to do more than what you read at the top. Oh, don't go away, Paul. I'm pushing the arrow, but it's not going. I'm pushing that arrow. It's not going. Reflect on the next is not there for. Can't just that. What does it? Next is not there for. It. Flush that out a little bit. What did you say? But just flush that out a little bit. Yeah. That's a tease. Next is not there for. Okay. Is that a reflection on free will or? Uh, no, it's a reflection on. In a very scientific society, we tend to think things happen because of causes, and we can put them in order. And if there's any one thing, I've even written a book, uh, I mean a, a lengthy essay for an historical magazine, next is next, next is not thus or therefore. You can't guarantee things happen in an order. In other words, in existence, there's things like surprise, which perfectly where we are. What pops up occurs. Next is never quite the same. Even if they tell you you're going to have a wet spring, what happens? Doesn't rain. It, it doesn't rain, or it rains so much it floods you. The Italians have. That wonderful saying, Basta San Antonio, enough. You've got your rain enough. Now give it up. Don't get with this raining. We're all in the bed ship in medicine. I could have probably written these better. I just jumped them up there quickly. But uh, look at all, all the gears and gizmos that are attached to that guy. Uh, it's, 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 it's both our salvation. And it's our strangulation. Uh oh. A magnetic resonator knows what's going on. I don't know if it does, but heating up. The history of the thermometer is an interesting history, it's deep in the history of science. It deals with how do you get something to go up, and barometers are the same under pressure. How does a bubble rise? One trick from total prediction. I mean, you know, sometimes you go for a blood test, and they draw about 16 different things going on in your blood from one blood test. And they can draw more. And well, I won't talk about blood tests, I just had a bad one. The microscope to me is always interesting since particularly I wrote the dust book because we're looking deep down into things. It's like a new universe. We always talk about the stars and the satellites and the planets. But we overlook how deep things are and how diverse they become. So we find that look at a tick under a microscope and we discover there's a flea in the tick, or a tick in the flea. And then if we look at one of those two, we discover there's something particular about them. And you keep going down, and even if you say an atom, somebody says, that's nothing, what about a particle? Then you say, which particle? Now, a lot of us read 
everywhere and everything hints, tells, declares. That's just the sky that's predicted with something. Oh, Eagle Vault. I wrote the Oiga Vault, but I don't know if the guy was Jewish or not, but then he's, oh my God. <laughs> What's going on? That's a normal human reaction. You didn't do that again, or oh no, don't tell me. It's it's built in us. We react to next. Uh oh. Did the wrong one. Surprise. Back to the kind of the jack in the box. So you think you're afraid. That's one of those old movies we used to see in the late 40s or 50s with those terrible actresses. And she was one. Johnny Belinda and some of those films I saw as a kid, they scared the hell out of me. I didn't know what they were afraid of, but I, the music and the faces. Big hope grows in a thin crack. Sometimes we can find hope, anticipation in the littlest thing. A little plant in a broken stem. Drought. No spring this year. Well, I tried to write, I don't know if I have this right. I tried to write uh oh, the way kids say uh oh. Is that how you do it? No. It's O H O H. Okay. I got hot O then. Okay. That was made an error. But I meant uh oh the way kids will be playing with a toy and it tips over and then that knocks this over and then the cat gets scared and runs and he sets the house on fire. That old joke about nothing happened but the cat left the kitchen. Oh, but he got his tail on the kerosene. And then back there. In broadly in human experience, death not represented like that, but death crops up. That's that famous painting by Munch, The Scream. And I just translated that to get me out of here. One of our children, we took to one of those Halloween houses in California. And he made a few odd sounds and you got me out of here and you went running out. Now, think of yourself as a reader. Don't think of other people as readers. Think of yourself as a reader. You're reading all the time. One of the things, the Japanese do this more than we do, but you read faces. And you read fortunes in a face. Now, if you had plastic surgery, <laughs> you're disqualified. But they do read faces. So your facial shape tells you your future. We actually have similar things where people would tell the bumps on your head. A variety of things are to tell what sex child you'll have. There are all kinds of ways to do it spinning needles and that. And if you're a palm reader, I don't mean one of these simple palm readers that says your lifeline is long. Look at that. Ye gods. I mean, look at all the ways they can claim to read your future from your palm. What do you think that is? Tea leaves. Tea leaf reader. But my mother, it was back in the 40s, the women would get together at somebody's house and the hostess would get a, one of those $6 teacups that were actually worth quite a bit, six bucks back in the 40s. So if you'd go to the hostess's house, you'd bring a teacup. And then midway in the party, they'd have a tea leaf reader show. So one came. I don't know which of my aunt's house or a friend's house came and she read my one aunt's fortune. And she said, I can't see anything in the <coughs> So she went and got another cup of tree, drank it, said, I just can't see a future. And then a 
bird flew in my uncle's house about three weeks later, and she died a couple days, two days later. So in our family, oh, my mother had read her poem, because my mother was just clowning around. She took her poem one time and said, no, nope, you got no lifeline, and she, my mom couldn't find one. And by God, she died. But it was, I, I think, maybe of an expected problem in a pregnancy the day they would have seen it and saved her long before it became, uh, what, what's the word, ectopic pregnancy, is that right? Ectopic. 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 Ectopic pregnancy and uh, the infection killed her. Oh, darn, I did the wrong one again. Aha! A Ouija board. I had a Scottish friend whose grandmother was good big on Ouija boards, and he claimed she could raise the dining room table by her fingertips just by meditation. It was Doug Beveridge's grandmother. I didn't see the table go up. He claimed he did see the table go up. But when you're a kid, this is what I'd ask you. How much of your head is filled with that kind of stuff? Rising tables, fear of maybe a cat, the hoot of an owl, a certain convergence of this. Aha, then there is the nearby sky. We're always looking up, hoping we'll see something up there. So we have astrologers. And how many people will actually pay quite a bit of money to go to somebody and have their fortune read? It's often up a little stairs now in the corner. And they'll do several things. And they'll give you a tattoo, too. If you know. oh, then there is numerology. You know a person's fate by counting the numbers their name adds up to. Some people argue that's why Napoleon Bonaparte changed his name because the way his, his name is Italian, but I, I, I've forgotten what it was now. But this I knew 20 years ago, so I'm kind of having to work on memory. But his name added up without good fortune, so he changed his name slightly, so it added up to good fortune. But, you know, having a favorite number, right? To tell the future. And a uh, classic example would be if you're a dice player, except they just tell if you're going to win money or lose. This is the real deal when you kind of combine mysticism <laughs> <laughs> and everything else you can into what's going to happen next. Look at that guy. Got a plant, a tree growing out of his head, all these arms. He's like a Shiva. He's like a Buddha. And there's the Buddha himself. He sort of dropped out of time and gone beyond time or into a stage of enlightenment and freezing from time. These are some, I don't know exactly who they are, and I cut their heads off with the slide, and I didn't know how to fix it, and I was trying to brush to get them done. But these are people at Delphi. And the one thing you know about Delphi, the oracle, it was the commanding oracle of the Greeks, Delphi. The other thing you know is, if you were going to Delphi to get your fortune tell, told, your fortune or your fate, you probably had to have money you had to get a boat to take you there, and you had to stay there for a while. And you were getting into high fortune. The uh, Middle Ages had somewhat the same. If you had, like, say, a broken arm, you might just go over to Holy Redeemer and ask for a blessing. If you got something more serious, then maybe you got to go to St. Paul, the first chapel in St. Paul, or one of the early chapels in St. Paul. If you really got a big problem, where might you go? What? Vatican or Lourdes or... So, uh, there was an actual kind of geographic distance between 
what diagnosis you wanted, but there you were you really weren't so concerned with the diagnosis as the cure. And if you wanted to say you were blind and you wanted to see, you might have to take a heck of a trip. And people did. Often they would do other things. Oh, okay, quit talking. Uh, I love the notion that often the blind, Theresius, blind some of the times or blinded, she can tell fortunes. Or, or he, I'm sorry, it's he. He can tell. It looks like she in that case. It's both. What? It's both. it's both. It was originally a he. He saw the snakes coupling, beat them apart, and he got cursed into turning into a woman. And then oh. years later, he saw them again, and he hit them again and got turned back into a man. Oh, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. I saw that drawing, and I said, yeah, it's a woman, but I know he's the guy yeah. who, who told Oedipus what the big trouble was at home. And of course it was, as you all know. And well into the, I'm going to assume this is 17th century, it could be 18th, but it's a treatise. It's a treatise on apparitions, spirits, and on vampires, and on revenants. And revenants are people who die with things they need to take care of. In Wisconsin, near my grandparents' hometown, Dean of Menasha, there was a priest who took all this money to say mass for the dead. But he didn't say the masses, but he kept the money. So when he died, he had to come back, and the church lights would go on at midnight. And what was he doing? He was saying, Man, sometimes revenants though come and do other things. Hi, Holly. Hi, Carol. So this is a giant reconciliation of all the things: love, justice, and justice too, because people are damned. But this is the final culmination of time, culmination, the eschaton or the talos, the final culmination. But we secularized a lot of things. Revolution truth at the parades. I didn't know what I was writing there. Truth on the parade, I don't know. The people judge the age. This is the apocalypse of a way. It's a secular apocalypse. The all-seeing and good lady, democracy cares for all of us. That's a, a theme that we're all in the cradle of democracy and we should all be, I'm, I'm exaggerating just to get the point across, we should all be rocked equally. I don't think we are, but we should be. Medicine has a history which I just can't get into tonight. It's fascinating how medicine grows off science and even starts to lead science. But there's almost no major scientific invention that doesn't lead to medicine. And then sometimes no major question lately from medicine that doesn't lead back into science. Perhaps, I mean, where you begin your story of medicine or history, you can go back to the Greeks or the Chinese, but just to start in the Italian Renaissance, you know who this is? That's Leonardo da Vinci. And he's drawing some of his, I mean, his drawings are like of moving rivers and all sorts of things in motion are wonderful. But here he's drawing aging. And if you've ever seen, his books were used in anatomy classes up to the beginning of the 20th century, his drawings of muscles, bones. And here is a great drawing of an old man. He has a series of old men, and he's drawing aging. Here is, after you dissect, and, and, and uh, 
Leonardo work with dead bodies and help in their dissection, but after you do that, all of you end up with anatomy that you can physically, you don't have to guess so much what the human body is, you physically see it. Eventually you'll turn the human body and it's different kinds of systems in the machines. Blood machine, breathing machine, glands, different routines. And one thing that is in medicine, at least Western medicine, is the notion that there's an order, a science, and a lot of things, and they find it in our bodies. And that's their basis of telling the future. We can be as predictable as the planets and moons. In other words, as there's a solar system out there that has an order, so your organs and things within have an order. This I use the heart thing as the great machine, the circulatory machine of blood and oxygen that feeds and keeps refeeding us. And if you think of the heart as a pump, what do you think was one of the most principal and first inventions? Crucial for mining, crucial for the liquor industry, crucial to get ships, keeping ships afloat, crucial for drying out floods these days, the pump, very fundamental machine. And what it's doing is moving liquid from one place to another. It's a machine, and that's chemical, chemical refinery is a set of pumps. And these are a bunch of fellows looking through at a microscope. Let us look within and below. Here's that thing I said about a hook. He was one of the great users of the microscope. I tease, that's a good reason to read. You look at my book, Dust. I trace that in my dust book. And here is Hook discovering cells. And the cork has cells. So they're finding, here's the point if you wonder, how do we get from diagnosis to time to here? What we're finding is more and more we look. In the scientific world, we look deeper and deeper in, we find an order, and when the order is out of order, or in disorder, then we make a diagnosis. And then the diagnosis starts to get us into a temporal frame prognosis. If this disorder continues or spreads, we'll get this. <laughs> I just put that in because Electricity has a wonderful history with medicine, and uh, it was it, sometimes it began as almost uh, superstition and mad experiments. On the other hand, it's electricity and frog, frog legs that got Volta's legs jumping. So there's a thing with this guy; he gets get the feeling he's going to shot himself to death. How chemistry and organic chemistry differentiates and how close that gets to medicine. And if we want to know what's going to happen in the future, take a pill today. I mean, at least that's, that's the hope. My pills are kind of my hopes. This is one of the early uses of an x-ray, and I just wrote it hurts. It looks like the skull got a lot of nails in it. I don't know if he was in a factory and the nail machine broke up or what. I have no idea, but I just pulled it off some of those images on the computer. So X-ray. There's all kinds of uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation in this case. There are all kinds of ways we look at ourselves. The number of machines we have to diagnose ourselves is astronomical, yet most of them, once you get beyond, say, the stethoscope, the, the, the um, what do you call it, the temperature? Thermometer. Yeah, thermometer. Uh, and you 
you get past a few of them, and all of a sudden, then you jump to x-rays. And x-rays really are, very, from an historian's point of view, very recent, 1890s. Only really got wide use in World War I, when you got scrap metal in their soldiers. So we look in at the people, and that's the end of them. So you saw slides. The poems went all over the place, and I didn't get enough to get you as far all over the place as you wanted. Now I do slides. Now I'd like to just talk for seven more minutes. That means, once again, I've got notes like this, and now I've got to reduce it all to a few words, and I'll take questions. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say to you is, we are like, to a degree, to a degree, we're like monkeys sitting on a branch looking at one another and looking at what's happening. Not just which one of us is getting the banana, but maybe I need a banana, or here comes the tiger and he eats monkeys. So we're alert, and most animals are highly alert. Anything that connects to their nervous system, there's a good case to be made that our nervous system, including our eyes, grow out of our attraction to stimuli. You can say almost we evolve to respond. And there's some words for that that describe our tendency to follow light. So we are very alert, but we humans go a step beyond and we puzzle and build up our emotions, and build up our cultures, not just on what's going to happen next, but we want to foresee. Maybe to take advantage, maybe to avoid <coughs> something that we don't want to happen to us, but we're very predictive as a creature, and we're readers as a creature, and then to top it off, we pass on our reading to one another. If we're kings or queens, we even get very high priests. They're almost on our level, and we put them on the top of our highest buildings, which we have the most stuff, and they read for us the stars, or we occasionally get prophets. That's sort of a different, I don't want to get discussing the role of the Old Testament prophets. It's a different kind of problem or question. But higher up people, we look for visions, bigger reading, and we look for cures. Meantime, for we humans, if we're a hunter, we have to find where the animals are. So we have to read tracks, we have to do all kinds of diagnosis of the forest or the jungle or the prairie, wherever we're hunting. If we're a farmer, we have to read soils, we have to read seasons, and we work with a more regular order than a hunter. You got what I mean? It re repeats year in and year out, spring, da da da, and we hope we put the seed in, we hope if we do certain things. But even in those cases, we get the head shaman or the head priest to come over and bless our animals so they reproduce. We maybe get the priest over to throw holy water on the soil. We ask for blessing. Or if we're having particular trouble, for many of the Africans it used to be someone stole my soul. And you could even be afraid when you yawn. See, Bob doesn't want to yawn a lot because of somebody might catch your spirit or your spirit might run away. And once they get a hold of your spirit, you're out of yourself and you can be cursed. So spirit catchers became an activity to get back. And people putting on blessings, people doing curses, and then, of course, really fundamental in traditional societies are spring rituals to get your young people married, to get things growing again, to 
ask God's gift or beneficence to make the whole thing work. So we're profoundly into time. And I haven't even talked about death. And when we talk about death, what happens to us? Who dies? Why do they die? What can we do to get them back? What can we do to this? Will they go further? And frequently, when you find people reflecting on heaven, pretty soon, God, my pet's going to be in heaven just to the one side next to the goldfish, and the goldfish and the cat will lie down together in heaven and they'll both be, I mean, but I'm joking, but people project with their mind fears, hopes, wishes, and even when you read the Wall Street Journal, which I happen to be reading lately, you, I don't read the business section, but it's like one big projection of what's going to happen to the market. Or what did happen to the market. That's not always clear what the diagnosis is. And you listen to political scientists and you swear they think they got a science. But when you follow politics, you're not so sure that's a science. That seems to me to be maybe a, something maybe more than a guess, but less than a law. And so, as creatures, we're very much the creature of next. And I am not in a position to argue how much does our brain grow out of pronostication, looking into the future, and I agree with what Mike's question was earlier. Certainly we have a portion of our brain growing out of that, a very important faculty, memory. And we have will, but boy, when you get to imagination, and judgment. Yeah, I'm using old Catholic and Aristotelian divisions of the mind. So there's an intellect that you're thinking, your reason, your form that works with other forms. There's your imagination that projects. It can become fantasy-like, so it has less and less basis, but imagination in the primary sense is you take images and project them outward. Then you got memory. Then you got judgment and will. And judgment is how do you weigh things? But often, what did the old card players say? Or what did the old soldiers say? You weigh so much, and what do you have to do? You have to act. <laughs> and you don't know how it's going to work out. You just have to act. Or there's a hundred reasons saying yes, and there's a hundred saying no. <coughs> and the hundred saying no, or this way, and the hundred... Our minds are attuned to work very much with the future. Therefore, diagnosis goes to the center, our center. So even when you're in the hospital and you're in the care of the greatest system and they're checking everything, there's still a lot of things you don't know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things they don't know, the, the hospital doesn't know. So that's all I have to say that. That's the end of that talk. <laughs> but I'd be glad to take any questions. I, I jumped like mad over stuff uh, that I wanted to tell you about the history of medicine and the different systems and all sorts of things. But It's not so much a question as a memory. <laughs> Um, I remember seeing you about two days after your bypass operation, <laughs> and your son Adam was there, and you sent him out to get a bottle of wine, the three of us, and I, I looked at Joe, he's had this glass of wine, he took the first sip, and he, it was like, I didn't think I was going to get to the other side. <laughs> well, one nurse told me when I had my bypass, his open bypass, this was the day before they were going to walk me through and show me the recovery room. And the recovery room had a big glass window. And people walked by outside. It was at Abbott Northwestern. They walked by the street. And she said, don't worry. No one can look through that window. It's a one-way window. I, said, I don't care if they see my bare butt. I'll be delighted if it's alive. I'm alive. So, I, 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 you know. Um, but that, 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was in that spirit. Yeah. It was enough. Uh, that, it, 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 for me, that was a very. In the old you're talking since before your operation, you really couldn't predict what was going to happen. Yeah, yeah, you don't. You. Uh, <coughs> yeah, you end up uh, in your mind writing your last will and testament, or saying farewell, or having your last supper, a uh, provisionally last supper, but you could have many more. I mean, it's uh, being alive, I, I'd love to pass out, this is my commercial for today, we're up to our neck in next. Well, we just have next, and if it's not us, it's the person next to us, or God knows if you've got children. That's just one next thing after another, <laughs> and it never ends. It just keeps nexting all over the place. And uh, but if you go one step deeper, I think it really gets into the structure of our minds. And some people can't control their next nextness. They just entirely give in to superstition. Other people say, well, I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to sit contempt where I am now and not worry. All right, try it for about 10 minutes. <laughs> I mean, we human beings are those monkeys, as I said before, that are up on a limb watching the jungle and the other tigers and watching the other monkeys, of course, sometimes getting jealous, Sometimes feeling we don't get the, but the difference with us is we got off the limb somewhere about four million years ago. And somewhere around four million years ago, we became bipedal. And some great things happened when we became a creature on two feet. We freed up hands completely. These became the finest instruments. I mean, our feel, I didn't talk about it, but we often say, I feel this is going to happen. We, so the future belongs to a sense or a touch. But we freed up the hands, but a point I like to make is we tied the eyes and the hands together. We tied the eyes and hands together together, which means we see both very close and we see very far. So we're a creature that can bite our nail, look at it, and then turn around and look at a sunset, so to speak. We, we go back between the immediate and the distance. And obviously some of us get lost in that process. That's what scares me so much about the, and I have no reason to do this, I'm not a child psychologist, I don't know about brain formation, but it scares me when I see so many kids looking and clicking, touching and clicking and looking, looking, touching, clicking, not because it couldn't take you in is important, but it's got two powerful things that we do, looking and touching and building them into a reflex and it's often then retied up to friends and social relations. So now we got the third big fact, I mean there's other big factors aside from thinking about the future, it's thinking of our relations to others. So we get the finger of the eye and worrying every instant what another person might say or what they're saying or what they're doing. I'm afraid we might be coming those monkeys back on the tree again. I'm, I'm not saying we are, but it, it, it scares me that their brains might not have all the movement that we once had, but maybe so. Any, any other, that was a sermon I was no good. <laughs> well, when you're talking about uh, medicine, obviously uncertainty is very stressful. But to some extent, certainty is worse because everybody knows the one certainty is that everybody dies. Yes. And as our diagnostics get better and better and could predict more and more, more and more people are going to have to face a reality that is absolutely certain 
not even uncertain to a slight extent, but absolutely certain. And to some extent, that's worse than not knowing for sure. Uh, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And we didn't touch things that are emerging from stem cell uh, research and genetic research, where all of a sudden we start to predict not just the longevity of a person's life by their genes, but we look into utero and know the prediction. And it even tempts some people to almost have mercy killing in advance of existence. No, it's, uh, you're quite right about that. The certainty isn't all it's cracked up to be. And because modern medicine can be highly predictive uh, if you're getting a, a disease like the loss of your mind, some kind of Alzheimer's, although there's a lot of new research going on. Just as I was getting this talk ready, a friend told me they're using new drugs, cocktails, for fighting Alzheimer's. So instead of taking one drug, you maybe take 17 or 18 mixed, in a, and I think they got that from the AIDS therapy. Why try one when you can try 12? But other, another article I read, different from a friend and a friend working with the doctor on that, uh, uh, was that in Alzheimer's, instead of looking for the symptoms, like what's a common symptom of Alzheimer's? You're losing your memory. Instead, they go microscopically down to the level of cells and see what the tissue of the brain looks like, and then by seeing if it's keeping its form or it's getting broken up, they predict that. Now, if you you get a, a certain prediction, Alzheimer's going to overtake you, and there's no cure yet. That's <laughs> I'm not sure you need that. Anything else? Well, I hope that wasn't all too grim. I mean, we've got to do something after that. There has to be a next after this talk. So, uh, <laughs> all, and all nexts aren't bad. There were those surprises there and happy times. But uh, you might mull on that. I think, I think the number of ways we're invested in time are terrific. And times are not one for us. That, if I were going to give a big philosophy talk tonight, I would have liked to tell you that time is not singular. We use the word time and space, especially if there's a bit of a physicist in us, time and space. We use them as one. Treat them as one. But I think the truth for us is there are times, not time, for us as humans. There are all kinds of times working around in our brain. And there's not one space. I prefer that a person think of the number of places that are in your mind. Imagined and real and wanted places and feared places and vacational places and cozy places. You get what I'm driving at? The places are many. They're not s simple space, like something you do. Oh, space. A to B to A to B. Okay, you got a square. A space. Just a line. So, okay, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.